Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So we will give folks, uh, other folks, a few minutes to get on. And feel free to uh, turn your camera on if you're so inclined. How are we doing, Adam? Any anybody else in the waiting room? No, no one else in the waiting room. No. Okay, okay I'm going to go ahead and get us started. It's uh, six thirty-three. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Sean Spano. I am will be your facilitator this evening. And uh, my task here is to help uh, manage the meeting so that we can accomplish our goals and, and purposes and have a uh, hopefully useful and productive discussion around uh, greater Eastside San Carlos uh, traffic issues. So uh, I'm going to take just a minute here and go through the agenda and organize ourselves for the evening and as I'm doing that, we will, after I do that, we will uh, do a quick round of introductions. You'll see that as the last bullet there as we move through the, uh, the meeting context. So again, Sean Spano, uh, just real quick, uh, a little bit of a biography on me so you know who your facilitator is. So I am an independent consultant uh, facilitator. I've done a lot of work with, I work with city government and have been doing this kind of work for 25 or so years. I have a lot. I have a, a fairly extensive background working with the city of San Carlos. Uh, as uh, some of you might know, I was involved in a community engagement project back in 2013 on the um, uh, uh, Transit Village, and that involved the uh, East Side Greater East Side San Carlos board members as well as city staff as well as Samtrans staff, because obviously it involved the train, and it also involved the uh, developer at the time, uh, Legacy Partners, I believe, was the developer. I also work with the uh, staff on uh, various issues, including working with council on their annual priority set, uh, setting session, and I've done that now for the last seven years, and that involves also working with staff uh, along with council. So I'm very pleased to be your facilitator this evening. A big picture here, we have uh, two meetings that uh, we're calling this meeting 1B. Meeting 1A was last night. The very same agenda for meeting 1B as, the, as meeting 1A last night. The difference, of course, is last night's meeting was in person over at the library conference room. Tonight, obviously, we're, we're on Zoom. We have two other meetings scheduled that will uh, uh, parlay, that will uh, work from what we find tonight, we'll take that into the second meeting, and I'll have a little bit more to say about that as we wrap up this evening. Those, those two meetings, one is scheduled for next Thursday, June 30th. That's in person, also at the library conference um, room. And then July 12th is the second meeting, 2B, and that will, uh, meeting 2B, and that will be on Zoom. So, I'll, and again, I'll, I'll come back to that at the end and, and uh, talk about specifically what will happen at those, uh, at those second meetings. Tonight's meeting, similar, exactly the same in terms of the agenda as last night, our two purposes are to collect, document, and understand the community's concerns with traffic 
and to identify the range of possible solutions to the traffic concerns that, ex get, uh, that are expressed tonight. Next week and the week after for meeting two, we will look more deeply into those solutions and look at pros and cons and trade-offs. Tonight, we're trying to understand what the issues are, what the concerns are, and what the range of possible solutions are that we want, that we want to uh, examine in more detail at meeting 2A and 2B. We have a couple ground rules tonight. We encourage everyone to listen openly uh, in a learning inquiry mode to speak candidly, tell us what your thoughts are, share your perspectives and views. Uh, we would love to hear from everyone tonight, although I won't be calling on anybody, it would be wonderful to maximize participation. And I recognize uh, having worked with uh, San Carlos over the years and having worked with uh, the East Side uh, board on that prior project that I mentioned, I, I recognize that there's a, a fairly lengthy history here with the city and the East Side neighborhood uh, uh, around lots of different issues, including traffic issues. And so I wanna acknowledge that. And those are uh, obviously important historical events that took place. And I'll encourage us this evening to be uh, forward focused as, as well as we start thinking about where is the uh, neighborhood now and where uh, uh, what would be best for the neighborhood moving forward in, into the future. So uh, uh, I do wanna do a quick round of introductions here. And then I'll talk a little bit about the Zoom setup and how you can participate in tonight's meeting. Actually, let me do that right now. Uh, you, the best way for you to participate tonight is simply to take yourself off mute. And if you take yourself off mute, uh, speak up. And uh, uh, if you uh, uh, are so inclined to speak, we'd love to hear your comments tonight. And then when you're not uh, speaking, it would, it's uh, best to put yourself on mute in case there's any background noise that can be a little bit disruptive. Um, also want to mention that there is a chat uh, function below and the chat function goes directly to, and you'll meet him in just a minute, to Adam uh, Locker. And if you have any comments that you want to share with staff, you can share those in the chat to Adam. Uh, you are free to put yourself off mute. Uh, if it, we have several speakers wanting to speak all at the same time, you'll see the reaction button down below. And if you click on the reaction button, you can see the raise hand feature, and we can start using the raise hand feature if we have multiple people wanting to speak at the same time. So if you have any questions about any technical issues, use the chat function because um, you'll, again, you'll meet Adam in just a moment, but Adam is, is uh, driving the Zoom meeting tonight and he is our uh, uh, technical expert. With that said, then let's just do a quick round of introductions and we'd love to, uh, um, for you to unmute yourself, tell us what your name is and any affiliation you have with the, uh, with the city of San Carlos or, or with the uh, greater East Side neighborhood. I'm going to go off, <clears throat> excuse me, the participant list. We have Carol Pierce first. Let's start with Carol and then go to Cleo. Carol, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Carol Pierce. Um, I live on East San Carlos Avenue and um, I've lived here for over 20 years and I've seen the traffic increase already uh, exponentially over the last few years. And um, I'm hoping that you will come up with some good solutions for us in, in the next few weeks. Excellent, very good. Welcome, Carol. Uh, we'll go to Cleo next, then Dimitri after that. Cleo? Thanks, I'm Cleo. I live at the corner of Bayport and Sherry, so it sounds like not too far from where Carol lives. I have a couple of 10-year-olds that um, commute over to Arroyo and um, enjoy the neighborhood. I've only been here a couple of years. It's been great so far, thank you. Excellent. Welcome, Cleo. We have Dimitri now and then Gina after that. Hi. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you fine, Dimitri. Uh, hi, Adam. Nice to see you again. Um, was, I'm the president of the Greater East San Carlos Neighborhood Association and um, am interested in seeing um, uh, the solutions that we've come up with. Uh, one thing I do want to note is that the community has put together a proposal and it got, I believe, over 250 signatures uh, for a proposal for partial street closures, uh, which we spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, and I'd like for us to focus on, on that, uh, 
uh, uh, other alternatives uh, and to discuss uh, um, a number of other items. So uh, it'll be an interesting discussion. Great, excellent. And then, my, my, and then Gina can go. She's yes, I, I'm not so good with the tech. So I'll just, I'm sitting here too. <laughs> um, I'm Gina and um, I am I live here on Montgomery Street. I'm one of the, the people that went up and down the, the block and talked to all my neighbors all the way up and down Montgomery Street. And so um, I'm really hoping for a solution tonight and thanks a lot. Excellent, very good. Welcome, Gina. We have a Jennifer next, and then after Jennifer is Patty. And you can just unmute yourself, Jennifer. Well, Jennifer is working that out. Patty, are you ready to go? Do you mean me? Hi, I'm Patty Marsters. Hi. Yes. Um, I wasn't going to say too much because I uh, went to the meeting last night, but I do want to hear what everybody else has to say. And uh, I want to point out um, the first lady who spoke. Um, sorry, I don't have your name, but yes, she is one of our neighbors on East San Carlos Avenue. And in the report, that was designate. Hey, hate. We don't have to count that because nobody lives there. And I didn't bring that up yesterday, but that is missing from the whole. Oaks. Yeah, Loreola Oaks. Welcome. Sorry. But yeah, I was kind of waiting for um, that to come up. Like, when were you going to figure out that, oh, there are people who live on East San Carlos and there are going to be more people when the whole uh, mixed use development re redevelopment happens on East San Carlos. Very good. And we'll have a chance to uh, discuss that when in uh, just a few minutes. So we'll definitely uh, put that on the uh, agenda this evening. Uh, Jennifer, if you're ready to go, and then we have a Sierra after Jennifer. Jennifer? Sierra, go ahead. Okay, hi, I'm Sierra Warner. I live on Cherry Street between Industrial and Bayport. And I was late, so I didn't hear the prompt, but um, thank you for hosting this meeting and having an engaging conversation with our community about what might work for the partial street closers. I appreciate it. Great, excellent job without hearing the prompt, Sierra. Uh, we'll move the staff now. Uh, we'll start with uh, Adam and then go to Niall. Hi everyone, I'm uh, Adam Lokar. I'm a sustainability specialist here at the city and just helping to run the meeting this evening. Pretty good. Niall? Thanks, Adam. My name is Niall Blackburn. I'm assistant city manager here. Been here six months. Um, although I'm new to this particular um, issue, I am not new to the area. I actually lived between industrial and um, Old County in the Alphabet neighborhood in Redwood City. Very good. Uh, we'll go to Steve next and then to Mark after that. Good evening, everyone. I'm Stephen Machida, the Public Works Director. I've been with San City of San Carlos. Had, um, had a bus. I've been with the city for about uh, five years now and uh, kind of worked throughout the Bay Area. So really interesting to hear what the group has to say about uh, this issue. Very good. And Mark. Good evening, everybody. I'm Mark Spencer. I'm a principal traffic engineer consultant. Uh, our firm is called W Trans. My office is out of Oakland. Um, I've been working with the city of San Carlos for many, many years on several different projects. Um, they came to us um, a little while ago and said, we want you to take a look at the cut through traffic issues in East San Carlos and start putting together some data and some ideas and help us with a, from a traffic engineering technical perspective, understand more about what's happening and help us you know, develop solutions and help move this process forward. And that's my role on this particular project. So thank you for having me here this evening. Very good, welcome Mark. And now to uh, city manager, Jeff Mul Mulpey. Hmm. Thanks, thanks, Sean. Uh, Jeff Mulpey, city manager. I've been with the city for uh, about 22 years now and the city manager for about the last 12. So it's a real pleasure to be here tonight and looking forward to hearing from everybody. 
Great. Excellent. I think I captured everyone. And let me give Jennifer one more chance. If you can get yourself off mute, Jennifer, and do a quick introduction. Okay, we're going to move forward. Um, and uh, if you have any technical issues, Jennifer, just use the chat. Adam will be able to solve those for you. And uh, the chat goes directly to him. Okay, Adam, um, uh, and uh, I think this is going to be very familiar to most of you, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, could you put the map up of the neighborhood and the uh, streets that we'll be focusing on this evening? Okay, so that's, uh, that's the area that we are looking at this evening. And just so you all know, uh, and you received a postcard for tonight's meeting, postcards went out to uh, 393 people, that's mostly residences, but a few business within this radius here. So if at any point during the meeting tonight, you would like to have the map called up because you wanna be specific, I'm really, I'm really interested about something at the intersection of industrial and cherry. Uh, by all means, Adam will be able to pull that map up so we can refer to that at any point this evening um, as needed. Adam, you can uh, you can take the uh, you can take the map down. Any questions? Actually, before you do that, any questions at all about the map, about what we're looking at here? Okay, per pretty self-explanatory, and I think very consistent with uh, with uh, what we've heard from the the neighborhood, as well as uh, how we uh, uh, shared the map and talked about the uh, traffic issues in the neighborhood last evening. With that said, then we're ready to move on to our first um, topic and our two major topics tonight. So the first major topic is traffic issues and concerns. And what I'd like to do here is have uh, Adam pull up a document, a blank document, and he'll type in the concerns that you all express, and that way we'll be able to have see those on the screen. And then, of course, we'll have a record of those this evening. Um, uh, and here we are uh, now enabling uh, interaction, discussion, your points. So just go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, express your concerns. Uh, and what we're talking about specifically are issues and concerns with traffic in the east side neighborhood within the within the radius that we just looked at in the map. And if you um, would uh, want to raise your hand, you can raise your hand or just simply unmute yourself and start the conversation and we'll record as we go. So what are, uh, uh, tell me community members, what are your issues and concerns with traffic in the east side neighborhood? Who'd like to get us started? Go ahead, Carol. I'm ready to, yeah. Um, like Patty said, um, my major concern is that we're being left out of this discussion. Um, there is a sentence in all those documents that you sent us. It is noted that while volumes uh, uh, on the segment of East San Carlos Avenue would increase more than that would be allowed if the area were a residential street, since this policy does not apply, this is considered acceptable. And as I said um, in my introduction, it's already, especially since they put the light in down here, um, East San Carlos Avenue ends right at industrial there and our parking lot is right there. And a lot of times we can't get in and out of our parking lot already because there are cars lined up down the street here. Um, Many of us, most of the, these units, there's 16 units, so that doesn't sound like a lot for an apartment building, but it's a lot of residences for a non-residential area. And most of us have families. Um, many of us have children, small children. I have my five-year-old grandson, and it's really dangerous on the street. Plus, there's all the cars out there idling at traffic times. Um, it's, you know, it's really hard sometimes um, to, to work around the, the, the traffic because our apartments are right there, right on the street. You know, it's, they don't have yards mm -hmm. um, to, to shelter us from it. Very good. So I'm just hoping that, you know, I, I realize that 
street closures would be great for the other streets, but that would just make us have even more. And the numbers that I saw on East San Carlos, the projected numbers look really, really high. Okay, very good. Thank you for that, Carol. And so you can see uh, we, uh, Adam has typed in access. You started with accessibility mm -hmm. uh, around uh, because, because of the traffic. And then you also mentioned safety concerns mm -hmm. as well. And then the idling cars, um, how is that a concern? What, does, what, what problems does that present? The, the, well, the noise for one okay. thing and the pollution. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, we're already in an industrial area down by the freeway and to have cars idling right outside your yard and your bedroom window is, is kind of, I mean, it's just not good, especially if you have small children in the house. Very good. So Adam, let's put up, um, let's put up noise and, and pollution as well. And we can put that, uh, you put that all on one line or a separate line, that's fine. That's good. And then Carol, uh, uh, um, uh, I also heard that, were you talking about the future development and that traffic will increase? Did I hear that in what you were saying? Yes, in the documents, uh, they, they were saying when the, this Alexander Center is built. Yes. Then, then this, and there, I, I'm not good with numbers, but they were really big numbers for how much the traffic would increase on San Carlos Avenue, as opposed to, um, you know, Cherry or Montgomery, any of the other parallel streets. And they said, oh, we couldn't do that if it were on Montgomery because that's residential. Right, very good. This isn't, so, but it's a mixed use street and this part is definitely, you know, residences. Excellent, very good. Thank you for that, Carol. And as we're moving through, you can uh, validate some of uh, what Carol said because those are also your concerns. And then if you have any new concerns to add on, please do that. So who'd like to go next to validate? One second, Carol's Sean, I'm sorry. Adam, can you please go ahead and add as number two idling and pollution then to the list? And, and the other thing I thought I heard Carol say is that um, while closures, partial closures, um, may benefit some um, streets. She's concerned that they may increase traffic near your location. Is that what you said? Yes. Kate? Yes. Uh huh. And and just with, not vaguely, what is your current location? Uh, right on the corner of East San Carlos and Industrial, right where there is a stoplight. Okay. So can we add that then? Um, closure of some streets may impact. Well, as a, as an item number three. Um, Closure of some streets will impact and increase um, traffic at the corner of East San Carlos Ave and Industrial. Very good. And we will come back to that um, when we come to the solutions, because you can see we're on issues and concerns right now. And then when we start looking at um, solutions, we're, tonight's uh, focus is on identifying what those solutions are and how they address the problems that, you that you're expressing tonight. We don't want to get too far down in the solutions tonight. That's really for uh, to into the details. That's really for meet for meeting too. But we definitely are, want to document that here. Okay, we're moving on. Who would like to validate what Carol said? Agree with that? Add any new items or disagree? We don't have to agree tonight. So if you have a different perspective, we're we're curious to hear that as well. I can take myself off mute. Um, I'm a relative newcomer relative to Carol, but I, um, my experience on Cherry and Bayport is that traffic has not been terrible to date. Um, most of my, I would say traffic concerns are mostly about how you get out of the neighborhood. So um, getting, having the kids walk out of um, walk out of the neighborhood, so crossing Old County, and I guess um, El Camino doesn't count for this particular thing, but that is on my mind, is getting them safely across El Camino on their own in the morning. Um, and then also the biking corridors um, along, for example, Old County, um, or I don't know, El Camino, when, you know, how, how we sort of, I guess, the access and um, to other places is the, the main thing that I think about when I think about traffic in this area. Excellent. So that's an accessibility issue. And I also heard the safety issue, especially with the children crossing Old County 
and that and that becomes a concern for you just in terms of just in terms of uh, safety issue and pedestrians. Excellent, very good. Thank you, Cleo. Uh, anything? Anybody else want to weigh in on issues and concerns? Um, I can. Sure. Oh, go oh. ahead, Sierra, and then we'll go to uh, I think it was Dimitri. Go ahead, Sierra. Sure. Um, this is Sierra from Cherry Street. We have two small children who enjoy riding their bikes outside. We're out in our front yard a lot because we don't have a large backyard. And what I've noticed being home a lot more since the pandemic is that people use our street to cut through from industrial to old county because to Carol's point, the traffic is backed up on East San Carlos mm -hmm. um, or they're you know, quickly trying to cut through our neighborhood to get from one corridor to the next. Um, and we can tell that these are cut through folks because we all have the parking tags in our window. And so, I mean, I was just out front with my kids for about an hour. I would say more than 50% of the people driving down our street did not have orange tags in their rearview mirror. Um, and they're often speeding. So I'm concerned not only about volume of traffic, especially with the development on industrial that's going in, um, but also the speed through our streets. And I know that Dimitri and Scott and others worked very hard over the years to get the stop signs put in, um, but I would like to see some other speed mitigations put into place, like, I don't know, speed bumps or something of the sort. Excellent. And so the primary good. concern is child safety, yeah. Perfect. Does that capture that okay, where we have you on line six there, Sierra? Yes, that looks good, thank you. Excellent, very good. Okay, are there any other uh, issues and concerns to add? Or uh, again, feel free to validate what you've already heard from your, uh, from your colleagues and neighbors. So I, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, take a turn here. Um, the, I'll, I'll second and or third uh, traffic noise and safety. Um, uh, but not just limited to East San Carlos or Cherry Street, um, Montgomery, Hall, McHugh. Um, each of those streets uh, uh, have, have that same issue of cut through traffic. Um, I don't know if this is the time to talk about the traffic study, but I have, I have a, a couple of points that I can make in, the, in, the, in later, which is yeah, perfectly fine. Would... That would be great, Dimitri, because um, sure. uh, we'll turn it over to Mark and he, we do will have a one page summary of the traffic study. He'll walk through and then we can engage him around the, the study. Okay. Itself. Awesome. Um, then the other thing that's kind of missing from the conversation so far is the reason that um, we brought this up is um, a, quite a large number of community members took part of the East Side Visioning uh, Program. Uh, and in that uh, program, <clears throat> one of the main bullet points that was articulated, and it's in the final report, is for the city to work with the community on traffic mitigations and a pilot program. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the reason that we had this sort of visioning uh, uh, um, um, process was uh, the city wasn't looking at the, the kind of issues that are uh, mainly going to affect the, the east side and particularly our, our neighborhood with the unprecedented level of uh, commercial development that's occurring. So the Alexandria project, uh, Giant Campus is one. Um, and we haven't, as a community, we haven't spoken out against any of this development. Um, but, but a lot of that was predicated on the city's ability to uh, help protect our neighborhood from being overrun by traffic. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is uh, uh, a, a point that we've made to uh, the developers who are certainly uh, uh, willing uh, and very eager to help uh, uh, help with mitigations towards that. Um, Alexandria Project isn't the only one. Um, we, uh, I think there's some 13 other projects. I just learned that the, uh, the cement plant was just bought. Uh, that's going to be another a big project that's two and a half acres or so, almost immediately, very, very adjacent to our uh, neighborhood and community, so we don't know what's going on there. But just the Alexandria campus alone, I believe, was something like 20,000 additional trips mm -hmm. per day. Um, when you add in everything else, we're probably talking more like 40, 45,000 trips per day. 
uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll table my, my uh, comments and concerns about the traffic uh, uh, study. Um, but that's, that was the genesis of our, um, uh, of, of the community uh, uh, banding together, uh, uh, putting together a proposal, which we spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, and, and then, um, uh, you know, uh, walk uh, a number of people uh, spend time walking up and down the streets talk, talking to uh, the residents uh, ab about the, the potential solutions. Mm -hmm. So, and we're here um, have, having this meeting because we actually have followed the city's process, which is going through the traffic and circulation uh, committee meetings. Um, we've had several uh, uh, meetings and discussions with uh, Stephen Mishita. Um, we um, uh, were before city council um, and um, uh, the, the, the gist of this is to address the, the kind of slow, you know, frog boiling in a pond of water <laughs> kind of increase in traffic that we've, that we've been experiencing over the last few decades. And then this 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 big big, big booming construction, uh, which isn't being looked at from a holistic fashion. And if we piecemeal this and just talk about, we're only looking at these streets. We're only thinking about traffic uh, without the context. Uh, then we're not really doing quite the the right thing here. I mean, we have to understand the underlying context and the motivation for the community putting together. Um, uh, it's its own proposal. Very good. Excellent. Thank you for that, Dimitri. And um, so we've captured that in terms of, and Carol uh, mentioned that as well, the uh, development that is uh, in uh, process that will be taking place, that becomes a concern for the, the you have issues now, but then the uh, exacerbation of those issues as the development on the east side takes place and you have have more uh, traffic. And so uh, uh, appreciate that that view. Uh, you did mention, Dimitri, um, the um, council meeting. And just so you all know, as part of my background in preparation, I, I was able to watch that May 9th council meeting. I read the staff report. Um, I saw the staff presentation, Dimitri, I saw your presentation and also your response, the uh, GESC's board response to the staff report as well. So that was part of my background uh, in terms of getting pr uh, prepared for this project. Would anybody else like, to, is there any other issue con or concern that has not been identified? Anything else to add to the list? We've got a really healthy list here. Uh, hello? Yes. Yeah, my name is Damon Bellinger. Sorry, I missed the intro earlier. I live on Montgomery Street. I just wanted to um, sort of second what Dimitri said. You know, it's not just traffic and safety today. We're concerned about like all the new developments around our neighborhoods and how that's going to impact traffic. So I just wanted to sort of reiterate that point because that I think that's a main a main concern of a lot of our neighbors. Thank you. Excellent. Very good. And and your name, sir, is Damon Bellinger. Uh, I, but I'm listed by my wife's name, Michelle. Very good, excellent. That's that's helpful. Thank you, Damon. Okay, um, uh, Sean, Sean, do you yes. mind if I make just a couple of points? So, traffic, noise, and safety. Can we please articulate the the streets involved? Um, because that that's way too generic and isn't specific enough. We 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 there's a, been the focus on East San Carlos, rightly so, but I, I do think we need to list <laughs> the, the, the the remaining streets um, uh, because all, all all of the streets are are, are impacted in, in in some form. Or other. Do you want to do you want to list those, Dimitri? Sure. Um, it's uh, let's see. McHugh. Can we pull up the map? Yeah, we can. sure. Well, yeah, it's not too many. Uh, so it's McHugh. We we uh, East San Carlos is is already represented. Um, M C C U E for McHugh. Yep. And did you say, uh, you as, I, as I mentioned, you San Carlos has already been mentioned two times on two, two points. Um, um, what else was it? Uh, uh, Montgomery, Cherry, Hall. Montgomery, Cherry, Hall. Yeah, and we could, I mean, we could mention Bayport, um, uh, but there's, their homes are either on the corner of Bayport and the street. So there's, I think there's only one house that's that's only on Bayport within the community. 
Got it. Very good. Excellent. Okay. With that said, then, um, uh, what we did want to do was uh, share with you what we heard last night in our in-person meeting, because we, again, we ran the same meeting and asked the very same question, and Patty will recognize this because Patty joined us last evening. So here's what the uh, concerns that were mentioned last night, and listening to you, they overlap substantially here. Uh, with every project, residency notice the cut through traffic. So cut through traffic becomes a major issue here. Um, back up on uh, the freeway or Old County, the neighborhood is affected. Certain times of the day are obviously more pronounced than others based on traffic patterns. Kids can't play in the street. There's a safety issue there. Address now before the development, knowing that that development is going in. Concern about people using streets to get to the train station that has no parking or drop off zone. And uh, that would be cut through traffic. It's gonna be a little challenging on the parking since I do know you have a uh, parking permit program in your neighborhood. Concern that closing the streets will turn other streets into El Camino Reals. In other words, what we heard from Carol um, earlier, you'll have um, uh, more, more traffic on um, uh, some of the streets, especially East San Carlos and Terminal Way. There they are. Um, and that uh, Tanklage will also bear the brunt of the street closures uh, because of major thoroughfares. Concern that the city's not making common sense decisions to move traffic. We heard about the island on the corner of Old County Road and Holly blocking the left turn lane doesn't make sense. And we've, we've heard that there's a concern uh, of making one lane in each direction, turning Industrial Road into one lane in each direction from the current two lanes in each direction. The problem with cut through cars is that they increase traffic, increase speeding, and affect the residential quality and character of the neighborhood. So um, uh, I think from my perspective as your independent facilitator here, we have a fairly robust and validated set of issues and concerns here. At this point, what I'd like to do is um, uh, turn it over to uh, Mark Spencer, the traffic engineer consultant, and he'll be joined by your public works director, Stephen Mishida. And uh, Mark, if you wanna make any observations or comments in response to what you heard. And then we do have, as you know, the one page summary of the cut through report analysis that Mark and his team did. And we'll show that in just a minute after Mark makes some initial comments. Thank you, Sean. And uh, thank you everyone who's provided some comments. Um, very helpful uh, for me to hear these firsthand and uh, even if they're being reiterated, whether it was from last night or from prior meetings, just reinforcing this, these concepts. And also very important to hear the, not just the history and, and also the frustration that goes with the history, but um, I'm really happy to see a representation from several different streets in the neighborhood. Sometimes we do these meetings and we say, well, everyone is just on one street. So clearly there's, there's like an issue on Cherry or just on Montgomery, but the fact that we've got uh, uh, just a good representation geographically is just very helpful, not just for me in trying to plan solutions, but I think also for the city to hear. So thank you for coming out and spending time with us. Appreciate that. Um, I'll start with what we've been asked to look at and how we started this process. We've been working, our firm as part of the team, it's working on analysis of the Alexandria Center for Life Science project, the environmental review for that on behalf of the city. So we're doing an independent transportation analysis of what would be the potential effects of that project. We happen to also be working on other projects on Howard, on Branston, on industrial, um, in downtown. We have a pretty good sense of transportation and traffic issues in the area. And several months ago, we were asked how, will we, how can we evaluate just what's the extent of cut through traffic? Is it something that's a pandemic related issue? Is it prior to the pandemic? Let's take a look and try and quantify things and try and build up uh, you know, some data. That's not to say that it will necessarily match exactly what's being experienced by people who live in the area, who work in the area, but let's try and put something together that, um, that we can then look for and then build upon. It's also important to 
to look at data and numbers, particularly when we start looking at solutions. The solutions generally have to relate to the problems that, that, are, that arise, um, whether they're speeding, whether it's traffic volumes, whether it's just congestion, whether it's I can't get out of the neighborhood at certain periods of day, I can't get into the neighborhood, I don't want people passing through the neighborhood. There's different solutions to address different problems. I will also tell you there's no one answer, there's no one silver bullet that'll say, this will fix everything. If you just do this, everything else will be fine. And traffic will go back to the way it was previously. That's, that's not a realistic output. So it's a package of solutions that have different effects. And the combination of those is designed to have relief and make for a more comfortable, a more safe, uh, more pleasant residential environment. That's, that's what I believe our the goal is as, as we've been tasked. Um, and if you think otherwise, or you think there should be more to that, um, I'm all ears, I'm willing to listen to that. When we started this, we looked at what were identified in the general plan as a residential street. So the summary that, you, that we have and that we've provided looks at McHugh and Montgomery and Cherry and Hall. We do have traffic volumes on East San Carlos, which is a different classification of street. That's not to say there's no residents who live on East San Carlos, but it is classified differently. So the function of the street is different, which means that the treatments would have to be different because it wouldn't just be strictly dealing with a residential street or a local street issue. There's other functions that occur on East San Carlos. So it's just a different mix that we just have to consider. We looked uh, initially at saying, well, what's the traffic volumes that are on the street? How much daily traffic is on each of these streets? And for those who have the cut through traffic summary, I think we actually could put it up on the screen. Magic, there it is. Um, just to get a sense of how much volume is on the street, um, and this is actually a, a mixture of different data. So I know it says cut through analysis October 2021, but the, the ADT, which you see here, I have it, I'm pointing, but I don't have control of the cursor. <laughs> but on the first table, that's average daily traffic. That's actually the average daily traffic from just a few weeks ago. That was taken in May before Memorial Day. How many daily trips are on each of these streets over a 24 hour period? just these particular four streets. You can see that McHugh is handling um, a larger load than some of the others, Cherry handling a, a smaller load of traffic, but generally numbers that you see when they're in this range, things that are less than about 800 vehicles a day are considered typical residential streets within certain tolerances for safety and for the amount of traffic that they have. That's not to say that all of these trips are just made by local residents, this is the mixture of all trips, deliveries, cut through traffic, if there's tra through traffic, um, uh, postal workers, just whatever may be happening, um, any kind of trip purpose. This is what the numbers were showing. And these are, these are just based on recent traffic counts. The cut through numbers, um, and I know these seem very low and I'm, I'm equally interested in hearing from people about this because this is unusual to us. What we did is we went Pre-pandemic, we looked at pre-pandemic data. The last two years, two and a half years of traffic data has not been what we consider typical. There's been a lot of change in the last couple of years. Um, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. But we took two months worth of data in 2019 and said, okay, this is typical. You know, people are going to work, people are going to school, we're going to pick up kids after school at soccer or baseball or whatever it might be. And how many vehicles were actually traveling between East, uh, between Old County Road and Industrial Road, or vice versa, completely between Industrial Road and Old County Road? And the numbers that actually passed through from one street to another, the percent of the total trips that were on the roadway was a relatively small percent compared to the total number of trips that were on the local streets themselves. Something came up last night, which, which was also an interesting fact. There are cut through trips that are very difficult to count. As an example, if you're traveling on a congested uh, Old County Road, 
uh, and you're heading north at a certain hour and it's backed up, you might then say, oh, I'm gonna turn right, I'm gonna go into the neighborhood, I'm then gonna turn left, go up a few blocks, and then I'm gonna come back to Old County Road. Just a little bit of a jog. So I'm on Old County, I'm off Old County, now I'm back on Old County Road. Similarly, you can do that on industrial as well. If you think that that saves you time or has some advantage, that won't show up. It's technically cutting through the neighborhood, but it actually doesn't pass through the neighborhood east-west. So it's a different kind of challenge for us, which makes just another variable that we have to deal with. Um, we've been looking through our various traffic studies and analyses of not just what are the conditions on Old County Road and industrial and at the intersections themselves in terms of their operations, but how do the queues back up? How are they backing up now? And how will that look in the future when you start adding in other development? In the last couple of years, and I'm speaking just in the pandemic time, we've seen a couple of factors. One, more people are at home during the day and working at home, which changes the mix of what's happening on local streets. One, people are home. They're not taking those trips to work. They're taking fewer trips for recreational purposes or going out to eat or doing things because we're doing more things at home. When they do travel, and this is something that's been realized not just in the Bay Area, but everywhere in the country, speeds are higher. Speeding is up, the number of collisions, um, the number of collisions is not necessarily higher, but the injury rate is higher because of the speeds. Speeds and injury rates go hand in hand. Um, and so one of the reasons we looked at 2019 data was to say, well, what, what did this look like before you know, we had these different traffic patterns? Because we wanna get a window into what might this look like in the future? Because if we have a sense of what's at least passing through east to west or west to east, then we can apply that to the new developments and say how much of that would potentially also pass through. The next part of this, the second table that's on the bottom of the table in your screen, the ACLS is the Alexandria Center for Life Science Project. That's the official name of the project. That is one of several projects that are currently being proposed and that are being reviewed by the city. It's by far the largest one, but I think uh, as Dimitri said earlier, um, when you take the other projects and combine those, you might wind up literally with twice as many of these uh, trips on the road. But this one really is the sort of the big elephant in the room. And so I just wanted to use this as a, to provide perspective. The Alexandria project is proposed in three phases. And each phase has its own amount of buildings, uh, space, it has a certain number of employees, and therefore it has a certain number of trips, vehicle trips that might be associated with it. It also has a transportation demand management program, which is designed to reduce single occupant trips, get people into carpools or van pools using Caltrain. Um, but even with that mandated program that the city requires and the county requires, it will still generate a lot of new trips. And after its third phase, each phase takes about two years roughly to come into fruition. It would be about 19,500 trips a day. Now that's hard to fathom, like is that a lot? Is it, well, it's a big number, so it is a lot. But what does it really mean? And what does it mean for the neighborhood? How do we break that down? In traffic engineering, we look at the morning commute period and the afternoon commute period as our focus areas, because there are peaks during those times. And if we can address things during those time periods, generally it helps with the rest of the day as well. So in the morning or in the afternoon, we're looking in the range, ultimately with the, all the project, it's full build out, of just Alexandria of about 1800 trips uh, in a peak hour as perspective. So what does that mean? What's 1800 trips? Well, if you look at Old County Road with one lane in each direction, how much traffic can that actually handle? What's the capacity of a road like that? Each lane can handle about 17, 1800 vehicles per hour in a given lane of traffic for a road that size and for its function. What this is saying is we're gonna be adding about that much traffic into the area. Not all of it will load on Old County Road. Not all of it will load on Industrial Road. It will be dispersed through different streets, but 
clearly because of where the project sits and the fact that there's a creek on one side and then there's commercial on the north side of it, it's going to have to load in and out from one of those three streets, Old County Road or commercial or industrial. And then it disperses to other streets, whether that heads towards 101, El Camino, 280, eventually these vehicles and it's the employees will be going to wherever their homes are or their other destinations when they leave. And when they come, they're coming from a variety of directions as well. What we wanted to do is say, let's take it to say, how much of that is going to potentially impact the neighbors to the north? And what streets might they use? Applying the same factors of what we've seen previously for how many vehicles pass through the neighborhood and knowing from looking at lots of data from the city and from the county, how much traffic is likely to head in that direction and either stay on Old County or Industrial or use one of the local streets. So if we scroll down a little bit more, please, towards that third table. What we wanted to do is give a snapshot and apply out just Alexandria trips, the ACLS trips, to these particular four residential streets. That's not to say the trips won't be using uh, the vehicles and the motorists won't be using other streets, but let's just take a look after each phase of Alexandria where the likely loading is going to happen if similar traffic patterns and cut through patterns hold up. And what you see on the far right is you have a growth in daily traffic. Those ADT numbers go up on McHugh and Montgomery. So you'll see McHugh goes to about 459 vehicles projected every day. And this would be about a 2028 condition. So, you know, about six years from now. Sherry grows from, um, you know, to almost 200 vehicles a day. And then the Alexandria Project has the potential to add that number, those numbers on the right. So 39 vehicles or 40 on the queue, maybe 60, 59 or 60 on Montgomery, and so on. What does this mean? It means that there's the potential to add vehicles on these streets as well as others. For the most part, the traffic is trying to get to a freeway and disperse from the area. There are different ways and different routes to get to 101. There's different routes to get to 280. And also there's a lot of it that's wanting to get to El Camino as well. That's gonna be um, heading, um, whether it's on, on Howard or other types of, or, or Britain, just other streets to get out of the area to the West. So this is just the initial snapshot of what Alexandria could potentially mean for the local neighborhood. That's so, you know, and from my perspective, I'm not here to, I, I don't represent Alexandria. I'm not trying to sell it or not sell it. I have no interest in whether the project gets built or not. I'm providing independent analysis saying, what does it mean? And is it a concern? And is it a safety concern? And is it an operational concern? And I look at safety as the top of the list. I was explaining this last night, and I explain this in most of the public forums that I do. In traffic engineering, safety is always at the top of the list, ahead of, well, are we going to keep traffic moving, or are we going to have a good service level or lower delays? Safety has to come first. And then we can deal with the operation and trying to make sure that we're not having queues back up from, you know, back up from street to street to street. We're seeing that now, we're seeing traffic returning to pre-pandemic levels. Some streets, some communities are seeing that more than others, depending on what the businesses are doing in those areas. Um, and other uh, locations are not back. Um, generally speaking, the streets and the volumes in San Carlos are not back to pre-pandemic levels. We've seen that by the by just observations, but also the measurements that we have. Um, but the Bay Area as a whole is returning to those levels, even with people returning to work in a hybrid form, you know, a couple of days a week in an office, a couple of days at home, that's a very popular thing right now. Um, so this is what we've been asked and tasked to do thus far. Following up to this is this process. Let's engage the community, let's hear from the community, and then let's brainstorm ideas and say, what is going to work in terms of achieving the objectives, whether that is partial street closures or cul-de-sacs or speed bumps or signage or diverters in the middle of the neighborhood. Um, it could be any number of things or, or a combination thereof. 
and to discuss the pros and cons of each. When I've gone through these processes in several communities, I talk about everything that we do as a trade-off. When we talk about, well, we're going to limit access to a certain street or a series of streets. Okay, what's the effect of that? Traffic doesn't go away. Traffic's gonna move around. It's gonna find another path. So if it's not gonna use street A or B, will it use street C and D? And what does it mean for those streets? Can it handle that? Is that a good thing? Is that fair? Is that equitable? Does that make sense? Everything's a trade-off with a, with a plus and a minus to it. So we wanna make sure we understand that and play it out so that we know what the likely outcome is if we take certain actions. Also, that we look at this not just because we're experiencing something today or that we have a fear of something or that we're projecting something in the future, but it's a quality of life question. What is the quality of life for the neighborhood that we're trying to either preserve or to achieve? Anytime we do this pro these types of projects, the end result is always the, the, the people who are most affected by whatever change there is are always going to be the residents themselves. They can either experience, you know, uh, stabilization of traffic, but any kind of change in traffic pattern are ones that the residents will live with 24 seven. So if you discourage traffic from cutting through, okay, you've achieved a certain objective, but it also means that people within the neighborhood are now taking more circuitous routes to get to their homes or get into the neighborhood or out of the neighborhood. And that has to be understood as well. That's part of the trade-offs. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm saying it just needs to be understood and thought about as part of the overall sort of holistic approach. And that's what I'm here to, to, to talk about those, um, those types of issues, um, potential effects and to help provide guidance. And ultimately, as I said earlier, to advance the process and move this forward. So I'm gonna stop there and I'll, I'll take questions, um, go through uh, Sean who's facilitating this and uh, we'll, we'll keep it going. Great, Th thank you, Mark. And uh, Scott, we'll go to you in just a minute, but I do wanna let everyone know that uh, this is a summary of the study. The full study is on uh, the city website under the GESC link. And I believe Adam will be able to put that link in the chat for you, just so you have that full study. Let's go to Scott and uh, questions for, for Mark or any comments and then Dimitri after that, Scott. Yeah, so um, Mark, I brought this up last night, but I just wanna make sure that um, everybody understands this. According to your data, um, the cut through traffic on Cherry Street is 0.1% which means for every thousand vehicle trips on Cherry Street, one of them is a cut through, okay? And well, you heard Sierra earlier mm -hmm. talk and say, of the vehicles she saw cut come through, roughly 50% of them were cut through traffic. So there's a big discrepancy between the data that you've collected and the perception of the residents who live here, because our, our perception is that it's more like 50% of the traffic is cut through, whereas your numbers seem to show that every five days, somebody drives down our street and cuts through. Yeah, and I have, a, I have, a, I have an equal problem with that, just so you know, because I, I, you know, I'm not one who comes in and says, well, you know, the numbers are the numbers, they don't lie. You gotta go with the numbers. No, this is the data that we pulled and what it showed. Why it's showing this for 2019, maybe it's the time period we pulled. Maybe that was what was happening at that time. What's happening today could be distinctly different. And I'm not saying this is not what was happening then. You could have had a 50% cut through issue then. And it just points out to me, there's a, there's a difference and I live in a neighborhood just like everybody else. And I think I, I know my street. I know the people on my street. I know, you know who my neighbors are. I'd like to think I know who my neighbors are. Um, and you know, if we see a vehicle that we don't recognize, we're like, hey, is that like a new neighbor? Or is that just someone who's moving through? Are they you know, going at a normal speed? Are they speeding? So I share these concerns and that's something that I'm aware of. And I'm, and I'm not saying you're wrong in any way 
and I'm not saying these are the absolute numbers. There's no way they can be right or wrong. I'm just saying the data that we pulled, and if and if it's if you want to know how we pulled the data and maybe there's something missing and a gap in there, I'm happy to talk about that because ultimately my goal is to help here and find solutions. I'm not I'm not going to fall on my sword to say this is absolutely right. At the the end goal that we, is what what's what we share. Yes, and and I think one of the issues that a lot of people have with sort of traffic reports mm -hmm. is the data isn't actually somebody standing on the street and looking at what's happening. It's sort of taken from cell phone data. It's taken from the tire uh, uh, mm -hmm. things. And, and the perception of the people who live in this neighborhood is that those numbers can't really represent what's happening. And, and that's where I think the, the disconnect comes between people who look at a, a report like this mm -hmm. and people who prepare a report like this. Th that's where the disconnect is. Yeah, and I'll, I'll be honest, I'll say the dis to me, the disconnect leads to a different issue. And ultimately what I consider success is that we advance the process and we come with solutions that, um, you may not you may not agree you may not say well we got everything we wanted you know we've, we've closed every street or whatever it is your goal is and i'm not saying i know what your goals are completely but that we've we've done better than when than where we were when we started the conversation okay we've, we're moving forward and frankly my job is to build trust and so when people question the data that's part of it what i do know though that that in terms of like the daily numbers of vehicles that are on the street how much daily traffic is on each of these particular streets, at least in the summer report that you see, that's pretty good. That's pretty good data. That's very recent. That's actually taken from a video that was put out for several days and counting each you know, car that's passing in a certain direction. It wasn't, we didn't pull license plates. We're not doing anything like that. So we're not tracking it. We just wanted to get an absolute count to get a sense of scale in terms of how much pressure is there on these streets, at least right now? And again, this is sort of building back into a, what will be the new normal, whatever that might be. So that part is actually really solid. And I'm happy, you know, we can discuss, you know, the cut through numbers are gonna be more than what we pulled from before. Are they 50%, are they 20%, whatever it is. The issue, it, it does matter, but at the end of the day, you live there, you know, people are moving through the neighborhood and using those streets to pass through from one to one side to another. Part of my job is not just to say, yes, I acknowledge that, but it's also to say, why are they doing that? And how do we stop that and, and try and control that? At the end of the day, they're public streets. Okay, but that doesn't mean that residential streets should be used because someone's trying to game the system and save a few minutes by going between point A and point B. And one of the things I talked about last night is, why do people do that? Well, and, and let's be honest, we all do that. Okay, we're, we're not all perfect, you know, motorists saying I'm going to stick to this. But, you know, there are a couple of things. One is there's congestion on the roads that backs up, that back up from intersection to intersection because of the, how much capacity is on a street, how many lanes are out there, how that traffic signal timing works, what's the traffic control. But also what we've seen in recent years the growth in use of things like traffic apps, like Waze or Apple Maps or Google Maps, people are using that in their cars. Some cars come with it built in now. That is actually causing a lot of change in traffic patterns. And as I say, hey, you could, uh, what's the fastest route between you know, point A and point B? Oh, if you go this way, cut over this way, cut back on this street, and then cut back over on the street, you know, you're gonna, it'll be a quicker time. That may or may not be true, but now, what that app's not telling you is you're going through a neighborhood and you're impacting local streets, making their life miserable because you've prioritized what you think is your fastest route choice. And it's not looking at whether those streets are local streets or arterial hooks or designed to handle more traffic. It's looking at a line on a map saying, here's a predicted way to do this better. And that is an issue for us in the traffic engineering community and for cities to manage that. And that's not something that gets addressed physically. That's an operational issue. That means we need to talk to 
Apple and, and Google and the people who are putting these out there. And a lot of cities in the Bay Area have done that. I happen to live in a city that, that has done that quite a bit. Um, but uh, several communities have done that. So they changed their algorithms and they stopped telling people, stop using Cherry, stop using Terminal, stop using the queue. Or, you know, stay, you know, if it, if it means you're going to stay on Old County or an industrial and it's going to take you a little longer and it's going to take you an extra cycle to get through the light, so be it. That's what we want people to do. We want them to use the streets that are designed for that. Yes, they're getting more congested. Yes, they're backing up further. But as a trade-off, would you rather have that versus, hey, they're passing by and you know my kid's playing in the street or biking on the street. And this is a local residential calm street. It should be lower traffic, lower speeds. So it's, it's that quality of life. And so there's I know I'm rambling a little bit, but I, you know, I talk traffic all night if you guys are willing to listen. The thing <laughs> I just, is, I just I'm, 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 I'll apologize about that, but I just want to finish this thought. Okay. The idea of how do we address this is not just through physical improvements. Physical improvements alone will only achieve so much. In, and in engineering, um, we like alliteration. We'll talk about engineering solutions. We'll talk about enforcement solutions. And we'll also talk about education and things like policy or other types of changes or how do we deal with things. It's not just physical building things or blocking things. There's got to be more to it. So it's, it's a range of solutions and attacking things from different angles. Okay, said my piece on that. Very good. That's perfect. Can I, can I just respond real quickly? Yeah, just, and then we'll move on, Scott. Bye. I just wanted to say thank you, Mark. I found what you've been saying extremely refreshing. <laughs> Um, the honesty about saying that the, the data is is probably not correct um, is is not something I've ever heard from a traffic consultant before. So, and and the the ideas and the ways about doing it, doing things is is refreshing to hear because usually the answer is just no. Instead, there you're giving us multiple ways of addressing it. Thank you. Very good. We are going to go to Dimitri next, and then to Nile, and then to Patty. Dimitri. Hi. Uh, boy, I have a, a quite a, quite a few things to uh, to discuss. I I, I want to second Scott's uh, um, uh, thoughts about uh, that. It's refreshing to hear, um, Mark. I appreciated your um, um, uh, you know presentation about. Um, about the cut cut through traffic and and the uh, you know how you how you you know put together the data, um, and and I do think that there's some pretty significant flaws in that uh, because um, uh, you're taking one day before uh, a major holiday, one weekday before a major holiday, so that that may skew the the average day of the trips in some in, in some fashion. So that's a very small sample size versus previous traffic studies, which um, it's hard to say what, specific, what specifically they were measuring. And that's one of the, one of the issues that we've had uh, in the past is what specifically is being measured in which way? Uh, and and uh, is, it, is it looking for an outcome that benefits uh, uh, the development you know, is it a pro-development outlook, or is it actually an objective analysis of of, um, uh, of traffic? And so, what, one of the things I, I took a really quick look at the study, and for example, like Montgomery Street has around 50, 51 homes or so, and um, uh, it's it mentions that there's about 257 average daily trips. Um, and then let's just assume of those 257 daily trips, they're all residents, which I think is maybe a little high. Um, it would take uh, four days before we would see three cars cutting through on Montgomery Street, given the 0.3% cut through traffic. Uh, on Cherry Street, it would take one cut through traffic trip every six days. So I would say that the data is pretty flawed uh, and it's not representational from an empirical observational view of what's actually occurring. So um, I, don't, uh, I don't want the city to take those numbers and treat them as gospel because I think there's a, 
very significant. There's a big difference between 0.2% or 0.3% and 50%. Um, and that number is somewhere in between, but that's a very, very high kind of standard of deviation there between those two numbers. Uh, I will say that uh, it's almost farcical to say that there's, uh, you know, that it would take uh, uh, from a, a, a thousand trips, only, only three cars would cut through on Montgomery or one car uh, would cut through on Cherry, for example. And, you know, we could extrapolate the, the numbers for the other streets. So I do, I do think that that needs to be revisited. Uh, I also think that when we're looking at that traffic study, one thing that you pointed out that I thought was really um, enlightening was uh, you're not counting like the a cut through traffic if someone cuts down uh, McHugh, goes down Bayport and then cuts down Cherry, right? That doesn't count as cut through traffic. We see a decent amount of that in, in the community. We'll see uh, folks turn up like, you know, terminal, go through Bayport, go through another side. Um, another thing that the analysis doesn't take into account is the fact that now that East San Carlos has a traffic signal, both on Old County and on industrial, and it didn't used to have one on industrial, that has been changing traffic patterns significantly. So uh, because of the light on uh, East San Carlos, when that light turns red, people will turn um, right on Montgomery and just cut through to get to um, at the heading of the freeway. They'll just speed down Montgomery, uh, hit a left on uh, industrial, uh, to get on the freeway. Um, so, uh, and then the, the same thing is, is occurs because, because of that light on uh, Old County. Um, uh, I, I found myself, um, if the light turns red, hitting a left on McHugh uh, and, then, and then going to my house. Um, so the, the, how the traffic lights impact uh, um, the backups and, 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 and impact the changes in traffic, I think is something that needs to be studied. Um, and I can say empirically that, that because of the lights, um, uh, I, I, I could see that, um, uh, that we're experiencing more cut through traffic because of, uh, because of these lights. Because what happens is if on industrial, uh, East San Carlos hits a red light, I, I see people often uh, banging a left on one to one of our residential streets and then cutting through, um, you know, either in the way that you described up to up to Bayport, cutting back down to avoid it and, and across or up, up to um, Old County Road and, 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 uh, and moving forward from there. Um, so I do, um, I, I, I don't think it's great practice to, to utilize numbers from different um, uh, from different studies without really understanding the um, what you know what and how specifically things were measured so so I do I do have some issues with um, uh, with the report um, and I, I was wondering uh, could we just have the um, the map of the uh, of the area uh, put up because I, there's a couple of things I'd like to uh, bring up for one second there we go Okay, awesome. So um, a, a, a couple of things. So Terminal is a commercial street. It's, uh, I haven't gone and measured it, but it's like twice as wide as any of the residential streets, uh, McHugh, uh, East San Carlos. Um, that, that's its own special thing. Uh, I'll, I'll table that for a minute. Uh, uh, Montgomery Cherry. When you look at those streets, essentially only one car really can fit uh, and, and cars have to move out of the way in order for the car to go uh, in the opposite direction uh, when cars are parked on the street. Uh, terminal doesn't have that problem. It's significantly wider. Um, and, um, you know, I, I feel it would be really, really useful uh, to have lights on terminal on both uh, industrial and um, Old County. Uh, and that may actually, uh, maybe even a, you know, special right turn where, where people could go through the uh, commercial area uh, what, um, and then avoid the residential streets and, and avoid East San Carlos uh, to cut through East San Carlos. Um, a couple of things that really feel nonsensical are um, 
in the city's plan regarding industrial, um, there are plans to make it a one lane road. And as a backup plan to our partial street closures, the only thing I can come up with is, is if we do that, then that would allow us the opportunity to build full cul-de-sacs on the end of industrial, uh, carve out that area where you could actually do a full turnaround. Um, that would work with what city staff is presenting uh, to council regarding the east side um, development by making industrial one road, we'd, we'd gain a lot of space. We could do full cul-de-sacs on the residential streets. Um, uh, and that would be our backup proposal uh, to the partial street closures. Uh, that way we could line industrial with, uh, with greenery, not only on the east side, but also on the west side. Uh, and uh, you know, perhaps staff would consider that a win-win uh, for everyone involved. Uh, but um, when, when we're looking at the data to not include terminal, I think is, is, is a little bit of a mistake. Also this, the city plans to make tanklage, or there is a proposal for tanklage to be one way and then part of terminal to be one way. Uh, I have seen in, in many uh, cities where uh, they've made streets one way, all that does is actually make it more of a car culture, um, particularly in, in downtowns and other areas, and it gets people out of walking and into their cars more. Um, and it, it really doesn't make sense to do that with tanklage and terminal, uh, given that those are uh, commercial uh, streets with businesses. Increased traffic on terminal in a, in, a, in a way could be viewed as a real positive because as more people travel there, they would actually see the businesses that are uh, on those streets. Uh, I noticed uh, uh, some, uh, some places as, as I was walking the other day and said, oh, I didn't know we had a, a, you know, a, tree, um, a tree trimming service, uh, another one here. Uh, and I thought about calling them up for, for some work. So I, it's, it's not necessarily a negative depending on what the street is. So you know, terminal as a commercial street uh, uh, taking additional traffic could make a whole lot of sense given the fact that it's significantly wider. Um, and uh, especially if you, if you keep it a, a two-way street in, in both directions. But if you look on that map, I don't know what the city's proposal is, what direction would be one way for tanklage and what, what uh, direction would be one way for terminal, but that would actually create significant problems for us because the commercial traffic would then spill into our community streets because people would, um, if they wanted to go to terminal and then get onto either Old County or industrial, uh, they'd go, ah, forget that. I'm not gonna, I, you know, I can't, I'm not gonna go all the way to Old County and then, you know, take a long loop around to get to industrial they'll just cut through one of our uh, residential streets. So I do think that uh, the city's proposal there isn't uh, fully thought through um, and, and it needs to be um, revisited and, and probably uh, tanked <laughs> um, because it, it's, it's, it, just, it just doesn't make sense. If, if, if you actually walk those streets, you'll see that, that it's, it's highly problematic and, and, and do doesn't make a ton of sense. Um, so, so, you know, to recap, my issues here are that the, the data that the traffic study is showing isn't represented empirically by the folks who live in the community. Um, and it's almost farcical to think that every five days there's like, you know, one vehicle that's, <laughs> that's cut through traffic when we'll see that many more vehicles within a, a, an hour span of time cutting through. So I, I do think uh, rethinking how to, how to get the, the right data um, would be a, a, a really good thing to do so, so, so we could figure that out. That's good. Um, anyway, so, so the, I, I think those, re regarding the traffic, I think, um, and the study, those are, those are my main points. Excellent, very good. Thank you, Dimitri. Uh, we're on to Niall and then Patty, and then I'll do a process check with everyone. Niall? Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted some clarifications, mostly from Sierra and also uh, Scott. So there's this perception, and, and also Dimitri, that um, the cut through traffic data doesn't seem uh, reasonable, and it's almost farcical. So that's the um, cut through data. Is, is there the same perception for just the regular trip data? Um, I, I'd like to understand if the trip 
information actually seems reasonable and it's just the cut through data that doesn't seem reasonable or is it both? Um, and that's my first question. And then my second question is, Mark, you mentioned that um, 800 trips a day is the maximum of what's considered normal for um, a residential neighborhood. I'd like to understand, is it just please, you know, when it's your turn, just say yes or no. And um, is, are, are, have you looked at other streets in San Carlos? Is, are these trips incongruent with what we're seeing in other neighborhoods? Um, I'd also like to get a sense of that because I know you've done other work in the city, I think. So if I could just turn it first over to Scott and Sierra and then over to um, Mark, I'd appreciate your answers to those. Great, and I'll encourage folks to be co as concise as possible. I'll go first. I really don't know whether the, the 177 trips a day is uh, reasonable. I'm not here most of the day. I'm, I'm working. Um, but I, I know that I, I see a lot of vehicles in the evenings um, using the street. Very good. Sierra? Hi, this is Sierra's husband. She had to jump off, but uh, I'm happy to give a little bit of background. Um, you know, my thinking to to watch to to looking at those stats. Um, yeah, I can't speak to daily trips either. Like Scott, uh, you know, what we see evidence of uh, are the cut through trips while we're playing with our kids out on the street. Uh, frankly, Scott had to come remind us that the meeting was tonight because we were out riding bikes on the street, and within the half an hour span that we were out there. Uh, there were at least 10 cut throughs and they're easily identifiable. Everybody that lives here has the parking permit as most of you, I think know. And so when you see a car that does not have a permit, uh, you know, your, your, your blinders go up and, and you make sure that you get them to slow down. So um, I can only speak to cut through and, and, and not the daily trips, unfortunately. Very good. Th uh, Sierra's husband, thank you for jumping in. Appreciate that. And Mark. Oh, well, I also, I, I, I just want to, I want to be able to chime in because of my name was mentioned and I do have some some feedback to those questions. Okay. Uh, uh, Mark is indicating go ahead Dimitri and then we'll go to Mark. Okay, sure. So I, I, I don't the, the the outlier to me is the, uh, the huge discrepancy on McHugh Street in terms of average daily traffic. Um, if, if we pulled up that report, it's, it's, you know, it's orders of magnitude higher. And that kind of doesn't make sense to me because uh, it's a lot harder to get all the way through to McHugh uh, to industrial, um, you know, because it, it, it doesn't, it, it doesn't connect in an in industrial. Um, and also just that sample size was just one day. Uh, but that that could speak to uh, I don't know if there's any directional data, but that could speak to the fact that there's a light on East San Carlos, and maybe maybe cars are hitting a left entering the neighborhood. Um, but I I question the 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 deltas between each of these streets, and and I do think a, a larger sample size would would make a a lot more sense there. Um, so that's. That that's my feedback to to that first question. I forget what this what Nile what the second question was. A uh, daily trips. Yeah, it was just what, what part of the data seems off to you. So it's the discrepancy between and among the streets. Um, it's the cut yes. through trips. But I also wanted to understand: does the total number of average daily trips also seem off to you? That's a little harder because. Uh, I don't normally stand outside of the street with a counter. <laughs> um, I would say if you averaged all of those streets, it might be closer to reality for each of the streets. Uh, um, but um, I do um, um, I do know that M M Montgomery traffic has increased since the traffic lights have been installed because people, you know, they see the red light and then they cut, uh, they cut through. But I, I think that that probably holds for any any of the streets. You know, once there's a red light, people will pick uh, the residential street of their of their choosing to cut through. Got it. Uh, Thank but you. yes, it's the average daily trips. I think is off per street. The cut through traffic is significantly off. 
uh, and 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 uh, but the the delta between each of the streets, I think, is significantly off. Okay, very good. And so, Mark. Sure. Um, one of the things, and, and I had quoted a number earlier, I think about eight hundred vehicles a day on a residential street. That is a good benchmark that we use for similar neighborhoods. In San Carlos, there's a, uh, a neighborhood traffic management program. Many of you are familiar with it because you've been following that process and going through the petition process and looking at tier one and tier two recommendations or stage one, stage two. And this is um, in San Carlos, and this actually is, I think, consistent with the city's general plan, a local street, that's a residential street, uh, should be designed to carry less than 1,200 vehicles a day. And a collector street, give you a sense, terminal would be a collector. And uh, it connects between, you know, you have a lot of streets that connect between Old County Road and Industrial Road, but terminal is actually designed to do that. Like you said, it's a little wider, different kind of land use. And the collector street could have a little bit more traffic and up to 4,000 vehicles a day. And then your arterial streets, which is Old County Road and Industrial Road and other streets get higher, 13,000 trips a day. El Camino becomes a state highway and you know the hierarchy keeps going up from that point. So when I said 800, that's kind of a good target uh, to try and keep in mind because of the fact that these are shorter blocks and the residential character kind of lends itself to that kind of environment. The tolerance level goes up a little bit higher in terms of what's allowed per for general plan and for definition of what the local street. So that's where I was going um, and why I was using that. I was kind of softening what's what's actually at the upper end of that. And I will say, you know, um, and I, I, I'll just leave it at that. that. That's, that's anyway, that's that's the short answer on where I was going with that. Yep, yep, that's good. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. We're going to uh, Patty and then to Steven and then I'll do a process check with folks. Go ahead, Patty. Okay, you just made me think of something else. But um, so last things first, the collector street or the, the 800 number, I'm talking to Mark, the 800 number means that um, almost you're telling the city, so I'd like you to clarify this, that we could have 800 cars a day on our street, and that's almost eight times the number of cars on our street. And, and that would be okay because we're local, but it isn't okay based on your tire thing, which I'm not sure if that isn't all BS too, but um, based on that tire thing, 800 cars total on any of these streets would push us into not very good neighborhood residential street uh whatever status on for that thing the other thing before you answer the other thing is i want you to be clear that this report kind of tells the city and Maybe you don't you didn't mean it because you said we could explore uh, mitigation uh, for cut through or cut against cut through traffic, but the city is hearing the numbers didn't show we have a good reason. I heard that last night. So, so what I feel like you need to do if you accept these numbers, they're they're good. That's like what we have right to work with. But then what is the, how much could they be off? Like, could, be they, could they be off by two, a factor of two? And, and then we'd be in the, hey, yeah, you're right. It, you would be noticeable. And then based on your um, internal traffic modeling, we should do something about it. And I kind of think that you're saying, Mark, that we need to do something about it because it's there. But what we're going to do is up in the air so far. But anyway, those two things that um, 
just please acknowledge that how many cars would it take for us to be, for our neighborhood to be messed up? <laughs> I'll put it like that. And, and, and irretrievably. And also, I just, I know I'm supposed to shut up, so I'm going to shut up. Answer those two questions, please. Okay. Um, so you're, there's a, uh, several things that you've brought up. And the first part is local streets are designed to carry a certain amount of traffic, or that's considered acceptable. That's the you know, 800 and as much as 1,200 vehicles a day. And to give you a, a I like to provide a, a scale, like, you know, what does that mean? Because you know, I can't picture what 100 vehicles or 300 a day might look like. In a typical condition, if people are going to work and coming back and they're running errands during the day and they're doing different things, a single family home, a house with a, with a yard, you know, that's a, that's a single family home, can generate approximately 10 trips a day from all the different kinds of trip purposes. If you go to work and you come back, that's two trips. If you go to the store and you come back, that's two more trips. If you go to school and you come back, if you go to school and then work, and then you go to, to run an errand and all the different trip purposes. Generally speaking, a single family home generates about 10 trips a day. If you have 50 homes on a street, you'd expect to be about 500 trips in a neighborhood. What Dimitri said earlier is indicative of exactly what's happening right now. If you have about you know, 50 homes on Montgomery and you're only seeing about 250 trips, that means they're generating about half the trips that they normally would. There's a lot of people who are still working at home and we're not seeing, we're seeing different trip patterns, but we're not even seeing the full amount of trips that homes would normally generate. That's, that's absolutely true. What you're looking at in the report in terms of the tire index, which um, that indicates what's actually gonna be noticeable in terms of a trip increase. And that's what those numbers are. And so there's a, there's a table in that report, um, and I think it's on page five, it's table three of that report. And a, that's the link that was provided in the chat. But it says like, you know, hey, if a street has about 500 trips a day, then if it, there's an increase of a, about 114 trips, you're starting to say, hey, you know what? I'm gonna notice that. That's, a, there's a, that's based on actual scientific measurements. Where do people start to notice like, hey, traffic's really gone up and I'm starting to feel a difference out there. You know, I'm not able to back out of my garage as easily, or I'm just not feeling as comfortable or as safe. And depending on the volume of traffic on a street, there's a tolerance and a noticeability of how much is an increase before I start to feel it. That's what that index is. It's a residential environment, and it's a way of measuring that. That's been used in several communities. Um, and there's science to back that up. So I, I will... Uh, you know, that's why we use that. And we decided to apply that here because we thought, let's look at this from a different perspective. The cut through traffic numbers aren't telling almost any story or enough of a story. And there's more going on here. And we know that everyone's coming to us and saying, we know there's cut through traffic. We can see it, we can identify it. Whether it's 1%, whether it's 5%, whether it's 50%, we know it exists. And we know we want to address that. And we're going to come up with solutions to address that. And I don't think anyone is denying that. And I don't think the city at this point is saying, hey, we're going to, you know, it, the problem doesn't exist. So we're not talking about it. That's the reason we're here. It's why we're having this conversation. The, so that's that part of the analysis. It does not relate to, oh, how much does it take before just, you know, all goes to hell in a handbasket or something. It's, first, we look at how much before it gets noticeable. And that's different from what an actual threshold is based on the capacity of a roadway to carry trips. Streets can carry more traffic than you probably want them to. That's a separate issue. What we're trying to do here is say, we're trying to preserve a residential environment that is safe, that is comfortable, and that maintains that residential character in the neighborhood. And we can use some of these factors because they hold up and say, we're not trying to say, hey, we're going to allow another 400 vehicles on a street that's only carrying four or 500 because that's allowable under the city code. 
but we know that's going to be a very noticeable change in the residential environment and the character of that street and the feel of that street. That's how we interpret and how we use that data and then look for solutions to address that. So the issue is how much additional traffic are we going to see coming through here? And what's the potential for that? That's where the analysis goes and how we're doing, how we're looking at that with each of these projects going forward. Very good, thank, thank you, Mark. Uh, we have Stephen and then Gina. Go ahead, Stephen. Oh, okay, thank you, Sean. Um, I guess, first of all, I just want to apologize. I was having a little operating difficulty raising my hand, but in any event, we've got that straightened out. Um, but thank you, Mark. That's one of the things I wanted to kind of bring up was kind of the, uh, you know, the estimated number of trips of a single family home, you know, how many trips are generated by that. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, in regards to, I, I guess maybe responding a little bit to, I guess something, well, I guess back, let me back up first. I guess, first of all, I want to say thank you for everyone who's actually submitted your uh, comments or, you know, verbalize your comments. I mean, this is very, very helpful. I think, um, you know, one of the things the city is committed to kind of looking at and finding a solution, you know, because we understand, we understand that, you know, this, this area, and as, as was pointed out earlier, with Alexandria project going in, you know, that's going to generate a lot of additional trips. And so we understand that. And so I'm, I'm really happy that we are having this um, here meeting tonight to, to have this discussion. But uh, I guess to the other thing, um, Dimitri pointed out, I think terminal, you know, is the wider street and, you know, possibly going uh, one way that, that, that is something that, you know, I don't, as a public works director, I would really not want to support. I, I think, uh, you know, certainly from what we heard, from uh, one of the business owners on terminal, terminal and tankledge last night, um, you know, I, I think he was very, very concerned that doing so would actually obviously impact um, his operation. But at the same time, I also see uh, Dimitri's standpoint uh, that, you know, actually having additional cars perhaps driving down some of these streets like terminal and tankledge that gives um, maybe more exposure to some of these businesses. So. You know, I, I think like we had talked before, there's kind of push, you know, push and pull. Uh, there's kind of give and take on this. So, um, and then the other thing I just wanted to point out, and this is something that's really, um, this is the first time I've heard it. And, and, and thank you for um, Patty for bringing it up last night where she was t had actually talked about, um, you know, possibly doing a uh, bulb out, you know, assuming that, um, industrial road, um, you know, were, were to be um, the number of lanes reduced. Um, you know, right now, that that is, uh, she, uh, you are correct, it's, it's one lane each, each direction with a center um, turning lane. Um, they will have a, a buffered bike lanes in each direction. Um, you know, so we have not, I have not heard about, you know, possibly doing a, um, a cul-de-sac that, that is, I don't want to say it's not a possibility, but you know, maybe that is a, a solution that we need to talk about, Sean, and that's something at the kind of next uh, section that we could talk about. Excellent. So that's all I had to say. Great, excellent. And, and in just a moment, we are, uh, and I'm uh, looking at the clock here, and we are going to move towards solutions, at least identifying those in just a moment. Uh, Gina, you are up. Hi, sorry, I was on. Sorry. Gina's iPad. Uh, hold on. Yes. No. Okay. Is this better? Uh, we, we're still we're still getting an echo. Why don't you just shut that off? Okay, that's better. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, gosh, um, I'm sort of um, <laughs> the the. I, I need a refresher on on some of the earlier points that that um, that were made um, regarding um, uh, the. So I, I uh, what you know when we talk about the impacts of the new development. Um, I do think that the uh, estimates for additional cut through traffic are significantly undercounted. Um, and as I was trying to allude to earlier was the fact that with lights on uh, industrial and uh, county, 
um, that's going to increase people's desire to cut through, uh, cut through the neighborhood. And I don't think that that's part of the analysis. Um, I do think that in one of the previous, uh, we're talking about a study maybe 10 years ago or so, uh, the city felt that there was no need to uh, alleviate any of, our, any of our traffic concerns because we weren't over the 1,200 uh, 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 trips per day. Um, because the city took the upper limit instead of the 800 limit, and this was about a decade ago. Um, and we did articulate that. And I, did, I do think I had that in one of my slides in the pre presentation to the, uh, to the city, uh, where the goalposts change depending on what the outcome the city wants to have. Um, and so um, I'm pleased to hear 800 is, is, is the number, but, but we, we have seen we have seen that number shift and in, in studies from a decade ago, our streets had significantly higher average daily traffic. So um, I, I, don't, I don't think that number, the, the numbers that we have from one day of sampling uh, are representative. So I, I, just, I just really wanna to, to make, make sure that point is clear. Okay, very good. Um, and uh, Dimitri, that takes care of, um, does Gina have a comment to make? Uh, no, I was on her iPad. <laughs> okay, when very I, good. When I, when I raised my hands, that's it. Okay, very good. Um, let's go to uh, Mr. Salisbury. Yeah, hi, uh, Anthony Lobe, um, Cherry Street resident. Um, one of the uh, factors that might have might not be visible in the data from the study is, and that may have been alluded to earlier when people had mentioned a distinction between local traffic and cut throughs is that we see typically cut throughs are speeding. And so it may be that a, a street, you know, a street could absorb um, a higher volume of traffic, but it's the cut throughs that are, it may be that the cut throughs are actually particularly dangerous and they're actually a high rate of cut throughs. Um, you know, it's not all, not all traffic is traffic, I guess was what I'm saying. And that a high rate of cut throughs is actually really dangerous for those little kids that are out on the street. Um, and I think that may not be captured in any of the study here. Um, one of the things to keep in mind is that cut throughs are typically going from um, a 35 mile an hour on Old County down to another 30, 35 mile an hour and off and on of the freeway. So they're going like, they're typically not gonna drop down to 25 if they're a cut through. Whereas local residents, you can tell they're just idling through at 15 to 20 miles an hour. So I think that's part of what we're getting at. It's not just total traffic volume. It's the people who don't live here, they don't care and they're just gonna rip on through. Okay, very good. So the kind of cut through traffic, right? There are different, there, there are different uh, types of cut through traffic. So appreciate that comment. Yeah, a different characteristic, I guess you'd say. Is it yeah. someone they're just going to come through? They're going to barely stop at um, at Bayport, maybe kind of slow down, and you can hear them just rip on through. Yeah, yeah, very good. Okay, okay Sean, I am, I have, Sean, go ahead. Can I just make one? I remembered the the, the thing that, <laughs> that I had forgot, uh, which is the uh, like using Google Maps mm -hmm. or or yeah. you know other other uh, traffic uh, uh, apps. Um, I use them all the time. Um, the apps never say go down Cherry to hit a left on Bayport to go down Montgomery, for example. Uh, every time I've, I've used them, I live on Montgomery, it says hit a right on Montgomery to get to, get to my house or when I'm leaving. It, 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 it doesn't, it, th th those alternate routes, while I, I understand the, uh, the, uh, the, the context that, that uh, these, uh, these uh, traffic applications can change traffic patterns, I don't think that's applicable to our small four block stretch. Um, so I, I think that's really important to, to, to note. It's like, we're not getting increased traffic because of these applications. That's okay. point one. Point two, our homes are not the standard kind of residential home. We moved here 27 years ago because we were a block and a half from the train station and two blocks from downtown. So we did the bulk of our, I did the bulk of my commuting on Caltrain. And when we do shopping, uh, uh, you know, we used to go to the farmer's market <laughs> and just walk down there and, when, and you know, we often, often go to the, the grocery store, we're on foot. 
uh, because that's that's the kind the kind of neighborhood that we are and the proximity to the services gets us out of our cars. That's one of the things that attracted us to this neighborhood and that's why the average doesn't really count. I can see that if you're up in the hills, you're gonna be in your car a whole bunch more times, but folks around here walk a lot. And so our, our, we, don't, um, we don't typically get into our cars every single time we need to run an errand, for example. So I just wanted to make that point. Very good. Okay, thank you for that. And Adam, I'm gonna have you call up the document on possible solutions. And this, this will be our last uh, topic for this evening. And our focus here is simply to identify what the range of possible solutions are. And um, I'm gonna jumpstart the conversation uh, when Adam calls up the document. And let's start with what we heard last night and then we can build on that if there's any Thing missing from the list, let's make sure that we capture it because we do want to capture all the potential traffic mitigation um, options that are available. Do you have that, Adam? Yes. Okay. And you can go ahead and scroll down, please, to last night's meeting. And I'll just share with you what we heard last night. And at the top of the list, uh, and um, uh, both Scott and Patty Marsters were there last, uh, last evening. At the top of the list, uh, and not in any priority order, but obviously the neighborhood and the GESC board has put together a, a proposal or a solution for partial street closure. So that is definitely a solution that is there on the, uh, on the table, so to speak. Remove the island at Old County Road in Holly. Now, these, one of the questions that we wanna ask is, how do these solutions solve the problem. So uh, uh, partial street closure, as I'm understanding it, the neighborhood is seeing this as a solution to the problem. Removing the island at Old County Road in Holly is not going to be a complete solution, but it's a partial solution. Limit turns. So it would need, need to be decided what turns, what time, are critical, right? You've seen the signage before, no left-hand turn between 4 p.m. and 7 p.m. or between uh, 8 a.m. and 9 or whatever. So that's another option that's on the table. The curb extensions at McHugh, Hall, Cherry, and Montgomery, closer to Old County, closer to Old County Road, the curb extensions. Speed bumps is another option. Uh, we've heard this uh, even, uh, I believe we heard this earlier this evening, do not reduce the lanes on industrial road. There's two lanes going in both direction. There is a proposal or at least a concept of making that one lane in both direction. Don't do that is the solution. Keep it two lanes going both ways. One way streets, making some of the streets in the, uh, in the affected area, one way streets. Work with the app companies like Waze, Apple Maps, Google Maps to change recommendations to limit cut through traffic. And Dimitri just made the point he doesn't think that's a major contributor. Um, that is something that, that could be done. And as I'm understanding it from Mark, that happens with other cities and other agencies are able to work with the, uh, with the app uh, developers to uh, change, the, change their uh, algorithms. And then curb extensions at Bayport. And I believe that was mentioned here earlier as well. So that, those were the range of options that were discussed last evening. Is there anything missing from the list? Anything we should add on to the list? Go ahead, Scott. Um, so I'm gonna add a few things that uh, have, we've sort of thought about since then. Um, lowering the speed limit on the residential streets to 15 miles per hour lowering the speed limit on industrial road, lowering the speed limit on old county road. Very good. Children playing signs, okay? Oh, yes, we, yeah. we see them on mm -hmm. industrial road down by the alphabet streets. Yep. They've got all kinds of, of creative ways of telling people that there are children playing in the streets or playing nearby. Um, and, and right now there's a lot of little things that people have peeking out from behind cars 
um, but really nothing on the street that actually tells people from the the driver's point of view that uh, 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 to be careful for children. Uh, right. We could repaint the sidewalks, uh, not the sidewalks, the crosswalks. They were all removed about 15, 20 years ago by a uh, former um, city engineer who, uh, let's just say, was not, not kind to us. Um, and uh, another idea is to make the streets one way from Bayport to either industrial or Old County. So uh, I'm, I'm wondering if the issue is the, uh, the point of view that the partial street closures, is it the barrier or is it the direction of the traffic on those streets? Um, so one way from Bayport to Old County and one way from Bayport to Industrial. And you could do those with signs rather than with, with enclosures. So the police and fire department would still have access to um, uh, the full street. And so would the garbage trucks. So you wouldn't have to build anything at the street. You just have a, a, a sign that said, you know, do not enter. Excellent. So those were the suggestions I came up with in the last couple of days. Excellent. Very Excellent. good. Great. May, may I get a clarification, Scott? So are you saying from Bayport have the direction of safe, safe um, Cherry at Bayport have the direction to go in opposite directions? Yes. You could either go left to industrial or right to, to Old County. Okay. Thank you. Then they would be one, one way in each for off of um, Bayport. Just, just another suggestion. Yeah, that's great. And that's what we're doing. We're throwing up suggestions here. That's great. We'll go to Sierra and then uh, Dimitri. And then to, uh, I'm going to say Mr. Salisbury, but I know that's not your name, but that's what name comes up. <laughs> go ahead, Sierra. Yeah, thanks. This is, uh, this is Matt, Sierra's husband again. I, I did want to second one of the uh, earlier points, uh, neighbor of mine, suggesting that you know, the cut throughs are at a very, a much higher rate of speed because they are essentially extensions for those, uh, for those drivers of industrial and old county. So I've always had the idea of those electronic signs that say your speed is, um, yeah. if we install those on old county and industrial, that would help slow down the traffic there, or at least keep it within reasonable speeds. In turn, that could help the speed of traffic that is cutting through our streets as well, where our yeah. kids are playing. Excellent. Very good. Thank you. And Dimitri? Yeah, hi. Um, I've got a, a number of points. Um, I don't understand uh, the one-way streets proposal from Scott from Bayport to Old County and Industrial. I, I, it, it's just not resonating in, in any way, shape, or form. So could, could that be explained a little bit more? I, I, I don't get it. Sure. So the idea is that you would come in in the same streets that we were talking about for the partial street closures. Um, and then you would use uh, Bayport and then you would be able to go down either street, either direction on the street as a one way street. But nobody would be able to come off Old County onto the residential streets or from um, industrial road, it's essentially the same as the, um, par, uh, the partial street closures, but there would be no barrier. There would be a do not enter because it's a one-way street. And this, the reason to do that is our streets are only wide enough for one vehicle. So why not, you know, the suggestion last night was made to make every other street one way in the opposite direction. And that that to me actually adds traffic to our streets. Whereas if we do one way from Bayport to say Old County and one way from Bayport to Industrial Road on all the, the residential streets, then it would essentially accomplish the same thing as the partial street closure without the physical barrier at the end. Okay. Very good. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I, I don't. I don't want to belabor that point. I, I'll. I'll have to think that through a little bit. Yeah. I'm not sure about that. But certainly, every other street one way 
I think is uh, not a positive uh, uh, solution. I think that's something that would increase cut through traffic, increase speeds and create substantive problems. I, I would be, uh, I'm, I'm, I'd, I'd be shocked if a resident uh, uh, thought that um, uh, through. Um, so a couple of proposals that, that I don't see here. Uh, I like the idea of lower speed limits. Uh, signage is all great, uh, but you know, the issue with signage is uh, enforcement. And you know, what we were told with our partial street closure uh, proposal that, that it's a big issue because of enforcement I don't see how signs change the enforcement equation. It, they, they, make, they make the enforcement equation uh, more, more of a problem uh, because it's just a sign as opposed to a, a physical barrier. Um, and um, a couple of things that weren't mentioned, uh, if, if, if I pull up the entire area, um, I think what we need to consider are uh, lights at Commercial Street on both ends, uh, meaning on Industrial and Old County lights on Branston, both on Old County and on Industrial, lights on Terminal, both on Old County and in Industrial. Uh, because what, uh, what was mentioned before is with the light on East San Carlos, uh, that uh, it increases, like for, for example, because of the light on, on East San Carlos, when there's a high, uh, high level of traffic, I think more residents will use that street to get in or out because they know there's a light so they can actually get onto one of those streets when there's a lot of traffic. Um, and the cut through traffic then gets increased with, within the residential neighborhood because that's the only uh, um, uh, street uh, in, in, in on, on the east side that has that light. But if you increase the lights and you put them on terminal you put, the, put them on brands and you put them on commercial, you would increase, uh, you know, what, what is that term for that street in arterial? You would increase traffic on those arterials, which would then reduce uh, um, traffic through the residential, uh, at least reduce some of those impacts um, uh, on, on the residential streets. Uh, but I, have, I haven't heard that uh, as a proposal, but I, I would strongly suggest that. Uh, what, whether or not it's part of our, our street closure uh, proposal or not. Um, and then let me go back to um, uh, our, the other proposal is if um, the industrial truly is going to become one way, then let's create a full uh, cul-de-sacs at, uh, at the industrial uh, side of, of each of the residential streets, because then we would have the room to, to have a full turnaround. And then, and as I mentioned before, because I, I didn't see it written down anywhere, uh, that we would have a, a green strip, not, not only on the eastern side of industrial, but on the western side of industrial, and we could kind of make that a grand boulevard. Uh, and and, and if, if we're truly thinking that more people are actually going to ride their bikes um, uh, and get out of their cars, uh, uh, having a pleasant environment like that and something that would help reduce uh, some of the... Um, um, heat island effect by increasing the trees as is increasing is, is very important. I think planting street trees uh, on our residential streets is something that hasn't been mentioned. Uh, but if we have street trees on the streets, uh, I know that we don't have those, um, the, 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 the planners, but we could do what was done on industrial where, where there's like a little bulb out to include a, a street tree that would, um, uh, have multiple benefits. Uh, you know, when you have street trees, it kind of slows that, you know, people speeding through the streets because they can't see as well. Um, it, it also reduce, reduces the heat island effect, beautifies the neighborhood, and also mitigates the impacts of the, you know, uh, I don't know what it is now, 15 to 20 developments, uh, many of which are asking for um, uh, uh, what's the you know, condition, just getting rid of the, um, Scott, you know the term, but you know, when they ask for a variance so they can build higher, um, uh, you know, that, that could, uh, having street trees on all of our residential streets and a plan for that, I think could, uh, could benefit not only traffic, but also uh, help mitigate some of these impacts of the developments. 
Okay, very good. And just to let, uh, just to remind folks, so uh, we're we're putting up options here. We're not going to, we're not, um, we don't have the time uh, to evaluate them. That's for meeting number two. So uh, let me go to. Uh, uh, I'll say it again. I'm apologize, Mr. Salisbury. <laughs> Yeah, I'll just go with Mr. Salisbury for the rest of the meeting. That's okay. fine. Um, yeah, so there were three points. Uh, one, um, it would be good, worth considering making Bayport uh, four-way stops. Okay. Do you have a nice, it's like, so if you cut up San Carlos and you want to like jog over, you can go rip it on down uh, Bayport. Um, so it'd be that would be a pretty low cost. I don't think anyone in the neighborhood's going to oppose that one. Um, the other is, I don't know if this is even something they do in the US, whether we uh, can do a time of day um, closure, like an electronic do not enter sign yeah. that just like, so that we could, um, no entry uh, going one way in the morning, no entry going one way in the afternoon. Perfect. Um, now, I don't know that anyone's gonna listen, you know, I guess if you're running a sign, you know, it's a pretty hefty ticket. Um, and then lastly, um, I was I would push back on this notion of, or at least, I might push back on this notion of industrial as a bicycle friendly street. Um, many of us that commute on bikes, myself included, um, we head right across Holly Street Bridge to the Bay Trail. And there's a beautiful Bay Trail that, that can get you up and down for long haul. And if you're doing short distance riding, you're gonna be heading up um, above El Camino. So I would at least talk to like Bike Coalition or, or Bay trail planning for recycling before really pushing too hard on making industrial a one lane for the per benefit of bicycles. As a cyclist, I don't, I don't know that would be a real top priority. Okay, very good. Thank you for that. And we'll go to Carol. Um, great. Thank you. Uh, I really love all of the suggestions that I just want to add, please, when you're thinking of this, remember to add that to, to add East San Carlos Avenue, the residential area to um, these, you know, wonderful suggestions. And um, it, it, as opposed to leaving East San Carlos as the sort of runoff from the other streets. Yeah. I, I don't know what a good solution is, but I just want to keep in the conversation. Very good. Thank you. You, uh, you're. We've come full circle, Carol, because you started yeah, us off there, very, and so yeah. this is this is nice symmetry here. Great. Okay, uh, Dimitri, I see your hand up. Is that up from last time? That's up from last time. Before. Okay. Very good. Okay, so um, this is just a really robust list of uh, potential uh, solutions here. So we are going to wrap up and and close out our meeting this evening. We are reconvening, as I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, uh, we'll have our meeting two. Meeting 2A is next Thursday evening, June 30th. Uh, we'll uh, start at 6.30 at the library conference room um, in City Hall. Um, uh, Niall, are we planning on um, food at that meeting? We sure are. And um, if you didn't get a chance to RSVP, uh, please do. Uh, we only have a couple more days left before we have to notify Bianchi Nings. And I strongly recommend it. I, I know that some of us are concerned and you know we could try to keep space and everything, but it really helps to have the maps out and to be able to touch the maps and point at things and to have dialogue in that way. But totally understand if you can't make that one, the same conversation will be had on July 12th. Very good. And so uh, we will start at, uh, we'll uh, serve the food at six o'clock and then the meeting will start at 630. That's right. the in-person meeting. And then we will have the very same meeting again, focused on solutions on July 12th. And that will be on Zoom, uh, similar to what we've done this evening. And the focus of both of those meetings, and we'll have the same format for both meetings, the focus is to look at those uh, solutions that were generated last night and this evening and to assess them, to evaluate them. What are the trade-offs? What are the advantages and disadvantages? What are the pros and cons? And we started that a little bit this evening, and we'll get into that um, in a little in more detail uh, next Thursday and on July 12th. With that said, Ben, really appreciate all the uh, participation tonight. 
great solutions, um, great brainstorming session there, and look forward to seeing you all either next Thursday or on Tuesday, July 12th. Thank you, everybody. Have a great evening.